Former President Trump throwing his, quote, complete and total support behind Jim Jordan, the Ohio Republican, to be the next Speaker of the House. His, he announced his big endorsement on social media just after midnight. Trump himself said he had been toying with the idea of serving as Speaker temporarily, even though he's currently embroiled in a civil fraud trial and facing four different felony criminal cases. Trump was even considering a trip to Capitol Hill in the coming days, but we're told now he's not expected to go. So what comes next on the heels of this? On Monday, the House GOP conference is set to meet as they, of course, scramble to pick a new leader. On Tuesday, they'll hear from candidates Jim Jordan and Steve Scalise in a closed-door forum. An internal election is expected Wednesday, and we could potentially see a House-wide vote for a new speaker that same day. The timing, though, could slip here if a candidate, uh, depending on a candidate, can unify 217 Republicans. And that is still a very open question. Whoever comes out on top will need to win over both moderates and hardline conservatives who just ousted Kevin McCarthy. Jim Jordan tells CNN he's the one who can do it. How are you going to get them in line if you were to become the speaker? I mean, those, those, I disagree with, you know, what, what took place, but those guys are friends of mine. And, and uh, you know, I think that's the, that's the message I've been talking to my colleagues about is who can, who can bring the eight in, in, into the, on, you know, part of the team who can unite our team. I think I can do that. If I didn't think I could do that, I wouldn't run. Let's bring in CNN national correspondent Kristen Holmes. Kristen, the kind of evolution of the former president on this endorsement was fascinating, given how he toyed with, uh, I think he liked the public attention about being potentially speaker all week. How did this actually come to be? Yeah, Phil and Erica, I mean, look, there's one thing that Donald Trump is, and it is the master of his own narrative. He likes the media attention. He likes the publicity. And he's also an agent of chaos. I was told that when he gave an interview to Fox yesterday, uh, where he essentially said that he wanted to go to Capitol Hill and that he would be willing to serve as interim speaker, that many in his team didn't even know he was doing that. So, again, level of chaos here. And he doesn't even mention that he would have to actually be elected, which goes to show you the level of seriousness that he actually had. And we were told by members of his team that he was never really considering serving as interim speaker, but was really getting out there. Now, I was also told that some GOP lawmakers were starting to express concern about Trump's outward toying with this idea of serving as interim speaker, particularly that it might hurt Jim Jordan, who has been a close ally of Donald Trump's. So late last night, Trump did come out and endorse Jordan, saying he is strong on crime, borders, our military vets, and Second Amendment. Jim, his wife, Polly, and family are outstanding. He will be a great Speaker of the House and has my complete and total endorsement. But as you said, Phil, I mean, it's really going to be interesting to see how that endorsement plays out, particularly with moderates on the Hill. However, one thing that really complicates all of this, as you know, is the fact that he is leading by such a huge margin in the race, in the primary, to be the GOP nominee. So that's going to complicate things for those moderates who possibly don't want to get behind Jim Jordan, but also might not want to cost Donald Trump at this time. Yes, a lot to consider there. Kristen, appreciate the reporting. Thank you. Uh, joining us now to discuss CNN political analyst Natasha Alfer, the host of Early Start as well. Casey Hunt is with us. As we look at where everything stands this morning, this, this reporting overnight, when, once we got this endorsement overnight, I think it begs the question, uh, Casey, and we'll start with you, how much will this move the needle? Uh, I think it, <clears throat> excuse me, Erica, I think it moves the, the, uh, the needle significantly. And here's why. There are, there are a couple pieces here. The first one being that Donald Trump has incredible sway among the House Republican Conference. They listen very closely to what he says. He's got a lot of loyalists there, much more so than the Senate, although, you know, that there are more Trump loyalists there now. Uh, when he was president, you know, a single Trump tweet could send the House, you know, spinning out, basically, and that reality still exists. He has, frankly, done more on, on that score uh, to, to lock down support among the House GOP Conference. So I, from this from this perspective, it, it, it says to me it's going to be much harder for a Steve Scalise to get to 218 votes needed to be speaker, because a lot of those people are going to listen to Donald Trump uh, and back Jim Jordan. Now, the second piece of this is those moderates um, that Kristen was talking about. And they are a very critical block, but there's a key difference between the moderates and the hardliners. The moderates think governing is important. And their interests are not around a prolonged vacancy here with the speakership. They've not been as willing, because they care about governance, uh, to blow up everything in order to get what they want. Um, and so I think it's much more likely that you see them work behind the scenes to figure out how to work with this 
uh, than to openly revolt against it. Yeah, uh, Natasha Casey hits at the key point. There are enough moderates or frontline Republicans to shift a dynamic in this race, to mm -hmm. keep Jim Jordan from the requisite number of votes he needs, to keep anybody from those votes. That's been the case over the course of about a decade and a half in this Republican conference, and always the moderates end up stepping back. Um, if you want to know how Republicans writ large, for the most part, besides kind of the really diehard Trump folks, felt about all of the talk about Trump and Speaker, I want to play something from Garrett Graves, who's a top ally, a former ally of <laughs> Speaker Kevin McCarthy, um, last night with our colleague Caitlin Collins. Listen. He's claiming tonight that he could actually take the job as has House Speaker on a short-term basis. Do you believe that that can happen? Uh, you know, look, there's a part of me that um, just just um, sitting down and buying tickets to watch the chaos um, would be uh, would be incredibly entertaining to see what the Democrats just created. Um, but in in a I guess more serious fashion. Uh, look, my focus is on restoring functionality and stability. Um, my guess is, just based upon precedent, that the next Speaker of the House is going to be a, a member of the House of Representatives. So for context, shortly thereafter, Trump endorsed, and the idea, which was never actually real, of him becoming Speaker went away. But I want to figure out a way to bottle and sell that sigh from Garrett Graves, <laughs> because I think that encapsulates what a lot of members feel, but maybe don't want to say. I love the deep sigh, the deep groan, yeah. but also did you catch the little dig at Democrats, right? Democrats caused this a very convenient overlooking of the fact that this all came from, you know, the House Freedom Caucus and, and Matt Gates. Um, I think what's interesting about this is that, you know, we move on so quickly to who is about to fill this seat, but the majority of Republicans supported Kevin McCarthy. Right. So this is really about a small minority having outsized power because they were able to manipulate the rules. Um, I feel that there are certain moderates who who don't want to be associated with Trump and Jim Jordan's close relationship with Trump, him, um, you know, leading the charge against the Joe Biden impeachment. All of these things make him a divisive figure. And so whether or not he should be the one to actually uh, to govern and not sort of take that speaker seat and make it more of a circus that is yet to be determined. You know, he's out there saying, look, I'm the one who can bring everybody together. I can unite everyone, Casey. But it does beg this question of who else could break through, right? Who could you get, Casey, to break through that could actually move things to that lane of, hey, let's do some governing here. Let's not just let a small group of very, very vocal folks run everything. I, look, I'll just say, I think there is zero evidence to support the idea that House Republicans are not willing to go along with whatever Donald Trump wants. It's just, there's no evidence. We've seen over and over and over again, and we've talked so many times over, you know, obviously Biden's been president for a couple of years now, but this conversation has somehow continued about, well, aren't Republicans going to break with Trump? You know, he's been indicted again, been indicted again. Aren't they going to break with Trump? And the answer is continually always no. And these House Republicans... You know, the majority of them answer to districts, to constituents in districts, um, who are the ones that are sticking with Donald Trump in these polls. And I just think that that's the reality that you're going to see manifested here. And I think in terms of the speaker's race and your specific question, Erica, I just don't see someone has to get to 218 votes. And with Trump endorsing Jim Jordan, it's going to be a lot harder to convince people not to back Jim Jordan over the objections of Donald Trump, especially because... The votes in conference, right, are, are private. First, they have to go inside themselves. They have to they take their own vote behind closed doors, but it's a secret ballot, and th that'll pick, you know, who the conference officially wants. Then this vote has to be public on the floor. So anybody that votes against Jim Jordan is now officially crossing Donald Trump, which we know that most of these members are just terrified of doing. It's a, it's a great point, um, and almost certainly the reality with the usual caveat that, hey, there are enough members to do something different if they want to. They have not proven willing to do that for the better part of the last seven years. Um, last question before we go, taking a step back, the House being paralyzed like this, the Republican mm -hmm. conference being where it is, a government funding deadline hanging in the balance, Ukraine aid hanging in the balance. What do you think this says about kind of the direction of things in politics right now? I mean, I think that as the American people watch this, there's this sense of being overwhelmed by the paralysis, right? And it gets to a point where you wonder um, whether it's you can just sort of blame one party. I think there's this sense of apathy because people feel like you tell us to go out to the polls, you tell us to show up in numbers, and then you tell us 
about what you can't get done, whether you're talking about the executive branch or you're talking about the legislative branch. And so as we look at election 2024, I hope that politicians from both sides take nothing for granted because there are a lot of people who feel like just staying home at this point as they look at the chaos that's playing out on Capitol Hill. Yeah, I think you see that in the polling, regar regardless of who they support, that there's just like a general malaise right now. Um, Natasha, Casey, thanks, guys. Appreciate it, as always. Thanks, guys.